well, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Robert Basili, and I'm happy to kick off our uh, April Q uh, Quantum Computing Group seminar series talk, uh, which as always, we hold every third week of each month. Uh, we'll uh, be meeting again uh, next month, May 21st, uh, where Thomas Iadacola will be presenting. Uh, today, I'm happy to introduce Gavin Knopp, who will be speaking to us regarding ionic quantum computing, specifically the Honeywell machine. Um, uh, as uh, seen in the slide here, Gavin is a graduate student here in the Department of Mathematics, Iowa State University. Um, uh, and without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the uh, turn things over to Gavin. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll be talking about ionic quantum computing and the Honeywell machine in particular. Um, and I've spent some time on quantum computing over the past um, year and a half. More recently, I've been focusing on topological materials though. But anyway, let's see if I can jump onto the next slide. So there are a couple of different, you know, general categories for quantum computers. There are superconducting um, based quantum computers. Um, IBM, Google have some examples of these. There are photonic quantum computers. There's solid state. Um, so like nitrogen vacancy based quantum computing. There's ionic. Um, so Honeywell is an example of a corporation with an ionic quantum computer. And then there are more, um, theoretical notions of quantum computing, like a topological quantum computer, which is what Microsoft claims to be working at. Um, one of the main reasons uh, that I care about the Honeywell machine in particular is Ames Lab has a strong focus on rare earths. And we've been looking at the suitability for rare earths with quantum computation. And Honeywell is a practical example of the usefulness of rare earths for embedding qubits in. So it gives us a way forward for rare earths in quantum com computation. Ideally, um, since Ames Labs does solid state work, we would like to look at quantum measurements with solid state, but unfortunately, quantum computation with solid state machines is still very difficult. Honeywell is also interesting because as of April 2020, it had the largest quantum volume uh, reported up to that time. I'm not aware of anything that's passed it yet, though there might have been um, recently. I haven't been keeping on top of that. Um, it is scalable enough that if error, um, a general error correction code is invented, it could potentially implement that. So this is a computer which could potentially be um, general use, not just a toy model, though the current models are toy models in that they only use um, between four and eight qubits, but it's easily expandable. Um, it works above zero point energy. Um, so this is with a couple of caveats. It's very close to zero point energy still, but it overcomes a fundamental limitation that a lot of previous ionic quantum computers have had, where they required absolutely zero um, heat anywhere near any of the atoms or anything. And so because of that, we can have the electrodes being held at 12.6 degrees Kelvin, which is still lower than we would like for um, general use of a quantum computer, but significantly higher than um, a lot of other ionic quantum computer designs. And the qubit gate operations are very, very short. Um, so Honeywell demonstrated that they were able to um, implement a lot of quantum computations in a very short period of time with minimal uh, cross-correlation talk of the qubits. So that's also a good sign. And my focus with this will be on the general principles behind ionic quantum computing. So Honeywell being a company, um, their quantum computers proprietary and they haven't released a lot of information. This is um, a collection of state-of-the-art general principles for ionic quantum computing and 
how you would kind of build up a quantum computer um, from scratch, uh, just given what we know today. So let's give an overview of what this, um, like a general uh, quantum charge coupled device would look like. So on the right hand side, you see um, we have a very general um, diagram. And this is just uh, for illustrative purposes, this is not the actual um, design used. So the idea is you have some loading zones at one end that you load the ions into. You have electrodes along all the edges and these electrodes control the ions and allow you to physically maneuver them. You have, um, in some cases, you either have a logical switch or a physical switch. So previous designs have recommended that there be an additional loop for if you wanted to um, reorder qubits, you would move them around the loop to allow new pairs of qubits to interact in an interaction zone. And this interaction zone um, would just be a zone surrounded by electrodes where you would take ions, you would move them close together, and then you would illuminate them. And depending on your means of illumination, you would implement a quantum gate, a two qubit quantum gate, which is one of the prerequisites for general purpose quantum computer. So that's the general architecture as we've um, seen in the past. Uh, the Honeywell machine will be slightly different from this, and I'll highlight some of the differences in the next slide. But um, it uses ytterbium for uh, the qubit, and it uses barium for sympathetic cooling. Um, this is important because we don't want uh, the cooling ion, in this case, to be the same as the ion that we store a qubit in, because we don't want any interference between the cooling stage, between interactions, and the actual qubit. So we don't want our cooling stage to decrease the coherency of our qubit. Um, we use photoionization at the start to load the trap and stimulates a Raman cooling for um, close to zero point energy. So even though this can work above um, zero point energy, it still needs to be relatively close. In particular, it has to be in what's called the Lambda regime, which just requires that the ions be cool enough that there's no coupling between the motional state and the um, electronic state that we care about. We use the hyperfine S orbitals for the qubit. Um, that's fairly standard. Um, and then we implement gates in two ways. The first is the Z gate, which is just Z rotation along the Bloch sphere. And that is implemented using the AC Stark effect. Um, basically, transport of qubits causes um, a phase shift in the qubit. And by uh, using a computer to keep track of how fast the qubits are being moved, a Z gate can be implemented through transport. And then the X and Y gates are implemented um, through Rabi oscillations, which are far more standard. So we take different um, uh, polarizations of light and illuminate the qubits, and we get our X and Y gates um, by that. The two qubit gate um, uses bichromatic illumination, and that couples the internal state of the qubits to the motional state that remains independent of the motional state. And this is one of the big advances with the Honeywell computer. Um, it allows a relatively robust coupling of the internal electronic states of our two ytterbium atoms without their um, vibrations relative to each other mattering quite as much as in other designs. Um, for readout, it's just a fluorescent technique. So we illuminate the qubits and do an electronic pumping scheme between different um, energy levels. When the electron falls, we get some fluorescence um, and measure those photons and then use that to determine uh, what state the qubit was originally in. And for initialization, we just use ion pumping, which is again, very similar to fluorescence. So that's like the general overview of what the Honeywell machine is actually going to be doing. And let's go into the specifics for that. So here's the actual architecture. And in the bottom left, you can see a picture of the actual machine. And on the top right, you get a cross section of it. So we have these yellow zones. These are auxiliary. These are just um, 
between the blue zones, which are the gate zones. Um, so we have uh, lasers every, well, periodically to illuminate the qubits and to implement gates on them. And then the yellow zones are just for transport in between those two. Um, Honeywell and their experiments, they only use the first two blue zones and this um, far right orange zone, which is a storage zone. Um, this is just because they didn't have enough to uh, fill up the hole. Uh, in this case, it's a linear pole trap. And then you have the pink load zone at the very right. And that black dot represents the hole that the ions are loaded into. So we just fire ions and redirect them into that hole and then use um, an ion trap to basically suspend the ions in a vacuum. Um, so this is linear. It's a 2D RF trap configuration, which means that um, we use AC voltages to cap at the ends and we use um, DC for the suspension. And you can see above that the electrodes are in fact out of the line of sight of the ions. So the ions would be here, the electrodes would be over here. And this, um, the electrodes being out of sight of the ions is important so that we don't get an accidental illumination. Since the electrodes are kept at 12.6 degrees um, Kelvin, there is potential that a photon from an electrode would hit an ion and completely destroy the state. Okay, so with that in mind, we're moving qubits back and forth along this linear trap. Let's talk about how we first set it up, get the ions into there, and then initialize them. So first we um, get our ions through uh, photoionization. So um, previous methods have used um, electronic bombardment to produce the terbium ions and then just simply load those into the ion trap directly. Um, the issue with this is um, in this particular case, we want uh, fine control over the mass and we want the 171 isotope of the terbium. So the way we approach that is we choose two different um, energy levels inside of the terbium and C up here just represents the continuum which is when the electron gets knocked out. Um, we choose a beam of light, to, well, two beams of light that counter propagate to illuminate this stream of atrobium atoms, which we emit from a thermal beam. Then, um, with this particular uh, wavelength of light, it's only going to match against this um, particular transition for exactly the 171 atrobium atom. So, like 172, we wouldn't have a quite um, a correct match. So uh, the energy levels wouldn't line up and we wouldn't get a jump of the electron from the S to the P orbital. And then if we get um, two photons to hit the terbium atom, so two successive illuminations, the electron would jump from the S to the P to the C, which would mean that the P and the S orbitals correspond to um, a uh, wavelength difference to the 171 um, ytterbium isotope and our ytterbium isotope would become charged. As soon as it's charged, we're directing it towards that hole in the ion trap computer. And since um, the ion trap is only going to suspend charged ions, only the charged 171 ytterbium ions are going to be caught by it. So that's how we load ytterbium. And we use a similar result for barium, which is um, we do the same illumination scheme. In this case, we have two different options for um, what wave, wavelength of light to use to lift it from the P orbital up to the continuum. Um, and these two options are just dictated by what type of laser illumination or laser material you want to use. The only important thing when choosing these wavelengths is to make sure that they don't relate to another internal transition, for instance, between the D and the F orbitals, because then you would get unexpected effects. And we also have the secondary illumination, and this is gonna show up a lot in the coming slides, which is um, illumination from the S to the P orbital um, can then fall, if you have an electron that goes from S to P, it can then fall to the D orbital, 
And in order to accelerate the um, illumination, we simply illuminate the d orbital with the 650 nanometer light, which causes the electron to jump from this local minimum back up to the p orbital, which allows it to be put into circulation for this final jump up to the continuum, which would make barium into an ion. So there are a couple of reasons to um, pick ytterbium and barium in particular. Um, one reason is barium is really good for cooling. And I'll show how that works in a couple of slides. But um, because of this, we want to pair barium with some ion to implant the qubit into. However, this ion has to be similar in mass. So um, if we paired barium with a more typical um, light ion for the qubit implantation, we would have a large mass imbalance between the 138 and maybe five or six or whatever. And this would harm our two qubit gate, which requires similar masses between the ions. Additionally, ytterbium has a fairly long demonstrated coherence time. So um, we'll talk about that a bit more in the future. It has these um, F orbitals, which really shield the inner S orbitals and allow longer um, coherence times than would be expected otherwise. So there are a couple of good properties that rare earth elements have in particular, mostly reliant on um, these F orbitals. And we'll kind of see how that uh, affects things in the next few slides. Gavin, I have, <clears throat> I have a question. I think you've already answered it, but I just want to be sure. Um, I think uh, you're talking about uh, cooling by, by, uh, by scattering of these ytterbiums and bariums uh, <clears throat> against each other. And if I um, understand correctly, the principle that's involved would actually be more effective cooling if the, the secondary ion was lighter mass. Um, and I think uh, helium is often used as a coolant for this reason. But you just said that there's a problem with using lighter masses in the ion trap. Could you, could you explain yeah. that? So it's not a problem per se, but one thing that you want to happen is you want, um, you want good shield, shielding on your electron. And that requires a couple of, um, a couple of properties about uh, you know, the electronic um, orbitals. Helium would fulfill a number of those, but this 4F orbitals also make ytterbium um, uniquely suited to that type of thing. Additionally, there are a number of different um, a number of different ions which are good for uh, cooling in a vacuum, and barium is one of those. So, in other um, helium, it's also um, possible to cool it down. However, um, with helium, you would have to you wouldn't be able to use it as the qubit itself. You would have to choose something else as the qubit then. Because the theme with this is we're going to choose separate, um, a separate ion for cooling and a separate ion for the actual qubit. So once you choose helium, then you'd have to either look to hydrogen or something um, larger than it. And none of the near elements are very useful as far as um, uh, uh, implanting a qubit. But you can do it. So there are a lot of different designs. I think um, one common one is, uh, I think with, there's one with ceruleum, there's one with carbon. So this is, there are like some advantages to this, but you can actually go with um, lighter elements as well. It's just, mm -hmm. I'm trying to motivate why um, heavier elements are not so bad in this case. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And so this right here, this isn't a cooling protocol. This is just um, photoionization. And the cooling protocol is um, slightly involved. But here's a diagram of the uh, part of the electronic structure that we care about with ytterbium. So um, we have the S orbital, we have P orbitals, and you'll notice on the outside, we have F and D orbitals. The main ones we're going to be caring about are these F, P, and D orbitals right here. Those are the main ones that 
are going to be involved with the different um, cycling methods that we'll use. And here's a more zoomed in um, approach with some individual gaps um, highlighted. So terbium has a nuclear one half spin. Um, one nice thing about it is it's first order Zeeman insensitive. So um, when we apply magnetic field and barium is, um, has Zeeman splitting, we, get, we can tune the barium Zeeman splitting independent of the terbium and set an axis without having to worry about the magnetic field um, affecting any of the internal electronic states. Um, it has hyperfine to optic coupling, and this is going to be one of the really useful things um, with a terbium, which might make it uh, more convenient than a lot of other elements. And that is, we can just um, apply a tr an optical transition between the S and the P orbitals, and this D and this D orbital. Um, and we'll get transitions between those two, and because of selection laws, we'll actually be able to um, get uh, transitions, induced transitions between these one and these zero states, which we're choosing as um, the states to implant the qubit into. So we're choosing the um, J equals one S state with the Z projection zero as our excited state and the J equals zero S state um, as our um, zero state for the qubit. And what will happen is we'll see um, different types of um, optical pumps being applied between the general S, P, D, and um, this will induce transitions between this one and the zero state. So with um, the general design of a terbium in mind, we can talk about ion storage. So in particular, um, how do we initialize it? How do we cool it? How do we um, read it out? Just basic things. And this is before we get into the logic of quantum computing for this type of design. So the first general method that uh, is used on the terbium and the barium is just Doppler cooling. The idea is you eliminate, eliminate um, particle on both sides with counterpropagating beams of light. And because of the relativistic shift that particle sees um, from its perspective when it's moving towards a beam of light, if we have those lights redshifted or slightly less energetic than our chosen um, uh, electronic energy transitions, um, the blue shift that the particle sees as it moves towards a beam is going to um, counteract the redshift and it's going to observe a photon in the direction it's traveling. Um, once it absorbs that, its internal electronic state will jump to a higher energy level and it will take a slight drop in momentum. Then it will emit that photon in a random direction and we get the possibility of a decrease in the particle's total momentum. So by just um, applying this for a couple seconds, we can take um, particles and slow them down. For a free gas, this is subject to what's called the um, Doppler cooling limit. However, these are constrained. So um, this is basically subject to whatever the photon, uh, the momentum of the photon is. Um, so we apply Doppler cooling to both the terbium and the barium. And with barium, again, we're gonna have this um, off to the side um, additional illumination to keep any electrons from being stuck in this D orbital. So the initial cooling is done with Doppler cooling. Um, after that, assuming that's cool enough, we can implement photon pumping. So on the right, you can see we have these um, solid lines. These are the lines induced by the illumination that we use. and. Um, we also have these dotted lines. These are the transitions that happen spontaneously. So the general um, uh, flow of what's happening is assume we have an electron starting in the excited state. We manually pump it up to the P orbital and we're tuning these to the transitions with a slight detuning 
And this is to force transitions between um, specific levels. In this case, we don't want to pump the um, our zero state up since we're trying to get the one state to decay to the zero state to initialize the qubit. So we pump this up to the p um, orbital, experiences a spontaneous um, emission of a photon, which either leads it to the d orbital or back down to um, the excited state in the s orbital, in which case it gets pumped up again. And we create the cycle where we pump it back up um, here, and it um, has a spontaneous emission of light, which drops it back down to either the zero orbital or the one or, or the zero state or the one state. And as the electrons go through this transition, they have um, an increasing probability of dropping straight to the zero state. And as we move the electron around, it takes about 0.5 um, microseconds to fully initialize the qubit with more than 99% uh, probability. Then we can use a similar technique to read out the qubit. So we um, illuminate the same transitions with slightly different um, detuning. In this case, we're moving the, um, if we have an electron in our one state, we move it up to the p state with j equals zero. And we try to induce a spontaneous emission. And uh, the way we do that is we just create the cycle by tuning each beam to each of the, uh, the transitions and then modulating those to prevent unwanted um, transitions in the zero state. So we get an electron that's going along this path, presumably. And at any point, it will, if it drops along one of these dotted lines, we get an emotion of a photon. We set up a detector to detect the emission of that photon. And if we um, detect that photon, we know that the electron was not in the zero state. It was in the one state to be in the cycle, which gives us, um, well, it gives us the readout of the qubit. And this can be done with more than 98% um, accuracy. Um, there is a theoretical upper limit on it, 99.5% accuracy, I believe, um, just because there can be spontaneous um, uh, decays to either the zero state or um, we could have sideband related um, uh, excitations where the zero state is accidentally um, jumped up to the P state. So there are possible, there is a possibility for error, but um, uh, it's fairly accurate. And since this is only in the end of the quantum computer, we don't care too much about how accurate it is since it doesn't propagate through any computations. Okay, so then right before and during the computation, we have the possibility that qubits are going to heat up. And um, we still want them to remain relatively cool. So there's this more sophisticated Raman cooling technique that we use on the barium ion. And we use sympathetic cooling, which is since barium and ytterbium ions are paired, um, they'll share emotional states. And as barium is cooled, it will cool the ytterbium ion in turn. So the basic intuition is we want to um, get a smaller um, momentum impact than with the Doppler cooling. Since with Doppler cooling, we're using um, uh, visible light, visible spectrum light, we have a fairly large momentum. And there's no easy way to address qubits using microwave light. So instead, what we do is we use um, two counterpropagating beams of visible light, each slightly detuned. The first one excites it to a virtual state. And on a short enough time scale, you can think about um, anything as a qubit practically. So it um, jumps up to this virtual state between um, our second and our third states. And then we have um, a second illumination, which then brings it down to um, this third state, which is between 
our first and second states. Then the uh, uh, the electron undergoes um, a decay or a emission of a photon, and we have a resulting um, cool down, very slight, similar to the Doppler effect, except here we use two beams of light instead of one. So we apply this to the barium ion, and you can see in this case we're using um, primarily this um, uh, p orbital as our third state, and then we use this distinction between the two Zeeman splittings of the s orbital as our first and second states respectively. And then again, with the additional um, illumination to keep electrons from being stuck in the d orbital and keeping this process from working. So um, as a result of applying this, our motional state for barium can be gotten down to about um, 0.17 in less than a millisecond. So it's very fast and we get down to almost zero point energy relatively quickly. Uh, Gavin, I have a, a question with all this uh, uh, pumping and sh you know, shining various lights on these, uh, don't you get other scattering processes that would tend to heat the uh, system? Um, that would tend to heat the system. Uh, so heat up, the, heat up the ions, you know, just basically, if I have elastic scattering of light off of an atom, I can impart momentum to the atom. Yeah. Maybe, maybe these are just so small that they're ignorable, but anyway, that would be a, a kind of, you have intense lasers, it sounds like, and if you're doing higher order processes like transitions to virtual states, uh, I can just imagine a, a lot of radiation shining on these systems, on these uh, ions and possible imparting momenta along the way that might, you know, heat up the, heat up the ions. Yes, so um, that could happen. The main thing here is because of the tuning, um, the light is statistically very probable to interact um, with the ion uh, using these types of Raman transitions rather than through elastic scattering. So we do get a net um, decrease in the emotional state. Um, despite the possibility of the elastic scattering. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically, um, if you have an ion by itself, how you um, initialize it, how you read it, and how you cool it. So that's enough for just um, ion storage. However, with the Honeywell quantum computer, and with ionic quantum computers in general, you have to actually physically transport the ions um, to move them close to each other. And um, like I stated before, we're moving these in pairs so that the barium can be illuminated um, and used to sympathetically cool the ytterbium. And um, with uh, ionic quantum computers, you can do two qubit gates in a number of ways. Um, one possibility is you string all the ions in a chain and you illuminate individual ones. And then those individual illuminations are somehow communicated emotionally through this chain of ions being affected and you get a two qubit gate that way. Um, another way is you can have them all be next to each other and you just move two ions close together in this linear trap and then once they're close together, you apply your two qubit gate. But then to, let's say you have a qubit at one end of your linear trap and a qubit at the other end. Um, then you have an issue, or at least you appear to, because there's no way to move them close together to apply the two qubit gate. Now you can resolve this, you can apply a logical gate. You can just swap the states of the two qubits. You could take your first qubit, swap it with a second state of the qubit, second and third and so on. Um, until you swap it with the n minus one qubit and then you apply your two qubit gate to the n minus one qubit and the nth qubit. However, um, due to the general lack of accuracy of two qubit gates in general, this is um, not done as it decreases the fidelity of the quantum computation drastically. So instead we're gonna prefer an actual physical 
rearrangement of the cube is. Since this is a linear pole trap, we're going to actually have to do a rotation inside of that trap. So this requires um, slightly more advanced ion transport than if we just used, for instance, a logical swap between qubits. The first thing I'm going to talk about is diabetic ion transport, which is when you transport an ion in what we imagine as a quadratic um, potential for um, uh, just by assumption, we see that there's actually an amplitude. If we assume that the ion starts in say the zero state, there's an amplitude that it becomes um, or stays in the zero state. And so we have to keep this assuming diabetic transport to zero. So just by studying in this case, our S of T is the position of the potential well. And as we move that position around, we move the ion in it. If we set, um, for example, S of T equals some velocity, a constant velocity um, for some duration of time, we evaluate this and we get the slightly simpler expression. And we see that this becomes zero periodically. So whenever omega T sub um, large T, where this is just the time that we move it over two pi is an integer, we get that there is no change to the amplitude of the ion. Um, the full expression actually used in perturbation theory is this much longer formula, but we can do a similar thing to that, um, which is we assume that um, we're moving it at a constant velocity b or near constant velocity b. And then we use um, a computational method to make sure that this phi just evaluates to be the identity. So um, in general for ion traps, we can use purely computational methods to determine that we're not perturbing the state of any individual ion while we transport it. So this is just something to keep in mind. Um, there is a limit to how fast ions can be transported, but in general, we haven't hit it um, with ion with uh, ionic based quantum computers. So um, it's not an inhibition to the actual quantum computation process in terms of speed. Another primary thing that we need is ion separation. So if we have two ions together after we implemented a um, two cubic gate, we also need to be able to pull them apart. So we imagine that these two ions are first in a quadratic well or pseudo potential. What we want to do is we want to move from the red potential to the blue potential and then finally to the green potential and have these two um, pairs, um, atropium baryon pairs, um, to be in the two separate potentials, one on the right and one on the left. If you assume a couple of things like symmetry of the potential, um, and uh, as soon as you assume symmetry, you get rid of the cubic term. So you just get um, that we need um, a quartic term, which corresponds to, in this case, an octopolar moment and a quadrupolar moment being combined to give us um, the split in potential. And then, of course, we use this AC quadrupolar moment, mainly because um, Gauss's law implies that we can't actually have a potential without a charge there. So we need to. Um, induce a pseudo potential, which gives rise to this split in the ions. And the electrodes configuration for this, or a very vague statement of what it is, is we need um, we need a configuration like this. Um, these outer two electrodes on each side are going to be mostly positive, and then we'll have negative ones, and these ones will be oscillating back and forth to give us the uh, AC quadrupolar moment. So this allows us to split ions apart after we've done our computation. We also need to be able to swap ions. And this is um, why I was talking about earlier with we're in a linear pole trap, but we want to physically be able to um, switch ions, not logically switch them. So we have this configuration um, with different labels for the electrodes and we have some electrodes underneath and above. And what we're going to do on the right hand side is change the relative um, voltages of all of these electrodes simultaneously. And the actual mechanics of how this work is moderately complex. The basic idea um, you can see in the bottom right, which is we want to start with um, two ion clumps. In this case, two would be an atrobium bearing clump. 
and one would be another atropium bearing clump. And we want to just rotate the two around the one so that their positions are switched. What this amounts to is we want to make um, a slightly elongated quadratic potential so that we get the ions um, aligned along this axis, if you can see that. And then we just rotate the potential. And the rotation of that potential corresponds to um, these very loose curves, if you can see it. What we do is we um, increase uh, the uh, constraints along the z direction to keep the ions aligned. And then we relax the, uh, we set the potential to be along the x direction. And then we move it along this uh, theta equals 45 degrees, theta equals 90 degrees, theta equals um, 135 degrees, and then finally 180 degrees through changing the potentials and the general curves shown to the right. And this allows us to just manually switch the positions of different ions. So that gets rid of any problems we might have had with the linear Paul trap design. So that covers it for um, moving ions. Now we can actually implement our ion gates. And um, XY gates are managed um, fairly standardly, which is just through Rabi oscillations on the Bloch sphere. The Z gate is managed through what's called an AC start shift, which I'll mention briefly. And I'll talk in more depth about the bichromatic scheme that we use for illuminating ions. So the Z gate is implemented basically by keeping track of the phase shift during ion transport and during um, dynamic decoupling via microwave illumination. Uh, the computer, uh, computer can keep track of this and then just manu manually compute what speed to set the ions at to get a phase shift. Um, the XY gates, we can just implement using um, transitions applied directly to, uh, well, Raman transitions, um, like we saw before, except in this case, instead of for cooling, we apply them to get this zero to one transition. And we use that in the Honeywell computer to implement pi over two type rotations over the Bloch sphere. Um, so they're limiting themselves for some reason. Um, I don't understand why. However, general qubits, um, uh, other papers which have used a terbium have shown that you can use it for any impulse and to get a coherent qubit. So any possible X, Y, and Z gate works. And then of course we use dynamic decoupling, uh, which combines with our AC start shift to give us um, both more uh, robust states on our qubits and also to implement the actual gate. So then the primary thing of interest in this computer is two qubit gate. So one of the first designs was by Zero and Solar, where basically we take all of the ions, we pack them together, we line them up, and we get a coupling between their motional states because they're so close. Then we can illuminate different pairs of ions to couple the internal elect electronic states of these two ions to the motional state, and we induce some sort of um, two qubit gate on those ions. One of the issues with this is that if we do have any heat, if this is um, above zero point energy, it completely destroys the transition. Um, so this new technique, new-ish technique, is subject only to the lambda regime, which is stated here, which again is just that the internal state and the motional state are initially um, disjoint in the Hamiltonian. The basic intuition is we assume we have uh, control over two Hamiltonians, H1 and H2, and these are gonna correspond to a bichromatic light that we're going to illuminate them with. If we apply these in turn, we're going to get what looks like uh, the commutator of the Hamiltonians plus some error term. So we can apply, um, in this case, this X, J, Z, and P, X, J, Z, um, where the J is just the standard um, total angular momentum and uh, the others are all standard as well to get this commutator, which is just Jz squared. And this is actually um, a Hamiltonian that 
we like because it corresponds to a unitary transform of the internal electronic states, even though, as you see here, the two coupling Hamiltonians involved correlations between the electronic states and the actual emotional states. So what we do um, to keep this, um, in this particular case with the terbium, to keep this transition to emotional state is we assume um, an order one perturbation. So we assume that we're only going to get um, illumination by at most uh, two photons. And we detune these photons. So in this diagram, you can see I used the solid line to denote a, um, the blue detuned light. And I used the dotted line to correspond to the red detuned light. And the qubits are gonna tr um, experience transitions only along, um, only kind of where the dots meet up with actual states. So if we start here with a zero one state, we see that the application of a blue detuned light and another blue detuned photon is going to move it first to a virtual state and then finally to um, the one zero state. So we're gonna get transitions between the one zero with motional state in and the zero one with motional state in and the one one in and the zero zero in. And this doesn't change if you know the motional state of the qubit at all. And um, perturbation theoretic analysis of this shows one, that we get um, a transition that's independent of the initial emotional state and that the um, time it takes to actually do the rotation or the second qubit gate is actually also independent of that. However, there is error. Um, in particular, you could have, um, for instance, in photons illuminate it. And as soon as this transition from the zero, zero um, in state to the zero, zero and plus one state becomes um, similar to the zero to the one state where these are just our qubit states, you start to get um, significant error, but this is pretty small as has been shown um, experimentally. So in the particular machine that we're looking at, we implement this and we get this um, molmer sorensen term which has a dependency on the initial phase. Um, to remove that, you just apply two initial um, single qubit gates, and then you apply their inverse. Once you do that, you get um, the following transform. This e to the i pi over four um, z o times z transform. And that's actually independent of the initial states of the uh, qubits, so we just get a simple unitary transform, which is what we wanted. There are a couple of things to keep in mind, which is, for instance, um, the phase of the light does matter. It has to correlate with the distance between the two qubits to make sure that we don't um, get any unwanted relative motional coupling or emotional states. And we also um, have to be careful that um, uh, this is another area where the weight matters. So terbium and barium being relatively similar in mass allows this to happen. And because we're only illuminating uh, the terbium atoms or the terbium transitions, this is only going to affect um, terbium. So the barium won't be coupled at all in this uh, procedure. And that's it. That's um, a brief overview of how uh, the computer works um, in completeness. So a couple of highlights from Honeywell's analysis is they did have significant um, room for error reduction. Um, they got less than optimal results compared to other research teams. So um, there have been reports of rare earth elements having up to eight seconds of coherence time. Whereas I believe that they had um, 1.5 seconds of coherence time. So that's one thing that can be improved. Um, and there are just a lot of different optimizations that can take place, especially with the complexity of the electronic structure. Um, their computer is, as it stands, not technically universal, but it should be fairly easy to make universal as soon as they expand their single qubit gates. And one of the most impressive things about this is the ionic quantum computer gives practically zero qubit correlation. 
um, which is a large issue with the superconducting quantum computers, having uh, qubits correlate uh, with each other without you wanting them to. So that's a very positive um, feature. And then here's just a diagram kind of for fun. It's from uh, Sandia Labs, who I believe may be invited to give a presentation um, at Ames Lab in a couple of weeks on one of their designs for a quantum computer that's very similar to Honeywell's. Um, the only distinction being that at the edges, instead of just um, capping it, they actually allow for more modules to be attached. So this also shows a lot of potential for extensibility, which is very useful, especially with uh, um, the need to make more extensible quantum computation. And I think, yes, I think that's uh, 50 minutes. So I have another slide, but that's um, only if I have um, extra time. Well, thank you, uh, Gavin, that's fantastic. Um, it looks to me like this is a, a great place for physics to, 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 to see benefits because you're doing basically what I would call uh, a lot of physics um, applications. Um, you you uh, ha have identified yourself as an applied mathematician, but uh, from my perspective, it's also applied physics. <laughs> I, Is that I have the applied math perspective. I also, um, I spent a lot of time in group theory and those types of things. So this is very, two very, you know, disjoint fields because quantum error correction is actually another interest I have. So it's not quite possible for me to bridge the physics with the quantum error correction yet. But I'm hoping that um, by looking more at uh, the relationship between electronic uh, structure of rare earth elements and quantum computing or quantum error correction algorithms, I might be able to start to tie those two distinct fields, at least for me, together more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, and I have one other question, and then others may have questions too. When you say it's not universal, um, is that because you have a, a hardware uh, configuration that has to be um, sort of set up in advance, and then you can't ease, and your computations are limited are limited by that specific choice of hardware alignments? Is that is that what it, is that what restricts it from being universal? So I, I'm writing this here as a caveat because um, it disturbed me that Honeywell restricted themselves to specific, um, the specific gates that they did. To my understanding, there is no need from a hardware perspective for it to be that way. However, because they did restrict themselves to those gates, which aren't universal, um, it seems to me that I should just um, assume that maybe they, they don't have the technology yet or something like that. I think based on other papers by academics that it is fairly easy to make it universal, but maybe the engineering teams haven't quite caught up to uh, the professors in that case. Okay, interesting, very interesting. Maybe we should allow others to ask questions also. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I have uh, one at least. Um, I was more just a, a request uh, of if you could give an example of what is meant by an, uh, an error in qubit correlation. Uh, for instance, it, maybe with the, uh, as you said, it's an issue with superconducting quantum computers, but not here. Yeah. Um, so one really um, trivial example would be, oh, there are a couple of examples that come to mind. Um, basically, you want qubit correlation only when you're activating a two qubit gate, anything other than that, and it's um, unwanted qubit correlation. So if you have, for instance, um, two superconducting loops right next to each other, they're going to generate um, a field around them, and that field will interact and create a Hamiltonian that uh, entangles them both. 
in some cases. Or another possibility is in this um, Xerox solar model right here. If um, these qubits are hot, relatively speaking, so you know, like 0.1 Kelvin or something like that, you'll get that the states of two qubits may unexpectedly become correlated without you applying a two qubit gate. So um, as you add more and more qubits, um, because they're gonna have different internal states that generally causes some sort of field or some other um, external, um, you know, well, an external field that could um, start interacting with the field of another qubit or affect another qubit directly. So um, with solid state computation, that tends to be um, an issue I've read, although I don't have as much experience with this, that um, uh, companies, especially like Google and um, I think it's DeepWave, uh, have had a lot of issues with it as they've tried to scale into, you know, dozens of qubits and in a couple of cases, hundreds of qubits, although in that case it wasn't, I believe, universal. So it's just any type of Hamiltonian between two qubits that's unwanted. Gotcha. Yeah. So generally, the model that we want is uh, we turn this binary thing on and we get two qubit gate between arbitrary qubits and we turn it off and we get zero um, correlation or zero um, entanglement between the two qubits following that. But not all quantum computers hold to that standard. So it's a relatively nice uh, property of this particular design. Well, we've heard, uh, you know, people rave about the ion computer uh, architectures for their superior error um, features or s superior small error features, let's put it that way. So um, you've given us some insights into some, some of those issues, but you're also the first time we hear uh, a hardware uh, introductory talk to quantum computing. So um, I myself, who's a theorist, feel I have a lot to learn about, you know, what goes on, on inside a quantum computer to fully understand um, issues that you've been uh, discussing. But uh, I certainly appreciate the overview you've yeah. provided us today. So oh, I'm happy to give it. Thank you for your presentation, Gavin. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Mm -hmm. If there are no other questions, I think we can go ahead and uh, wrap up then for today. And um, and Bo, you, you uh, indicated at the beginning that there is another seminar planned a month from now. Could you uh, mention it again? I think not everybody was here at the beginning. Sure. Uh, so uh, uh, once again, I'd like to thank Gavin here uh, for the great presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. Um, uh, we will be meeting again, uh, as always, the third Friday of each month. Uh, next month will be on May 21st, um, and will be uh, by Thomas Iadacola. Um, uh, I will keep you posted on uh, the uh, information regarding that presentation, but um, we hope to see you back here for that as well. Um, Great. So let me add my thanks to the audience for, for coming today and hope to again see you uh, at our next